Hey everyone, it's Jason Lamb, reporter with WTVF News Channel 5 in Nashville. And I want to start today with a quote. You may have heard this one before. It's from poet Maya Angelou, who said, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Now that's great advice on how to carry yourself throughout life, but it's also good advice on storytelling. You can pack a script full of statistics and a ton of information. And don't get me wrong, information and details are important. But if you don't help your audience feel something, they're going to forget a lot of that information, all that work you put in for the day, as the audience moves on to the next thing in their lives. So the bottom line is, we've got to help our viewers feel something in our stories. So how can you make your stories memorable? I'm gonna walk you through one story to give you some tips on how you can do just that. But here's the thing, I'm gonna show you this story twice. First is how a typical reporter might put together the story, one who doesn't use storytelling skills to get across an emotion to the audience. Then I'm gonna show you the same assignment, but rearranged using specific storytelling tools that anyone can use to make your viewers more likely to feel something and remember your story long after it's over. I think you'll be able to feel the difference too. And when you're putting a story together, if you can feel the difference, chances are your audience can as well. So here's the assignment. A tornado comes through your neighborhood. 18 people are dead and the cleanup is underway. How would you tell this story? Well, here's one way someone might do it. What I'm gonna show you now is a package that never actually aired. I put this version together way after the fact, and it's just for this training to show how a typical reporter or MMJ might write a story like this. And as you watch this, ask yourself, are you feeling anything? The massive Cookville tornado creating a path of destruction through Middle Tennessee this morning, ripping this neighborhood apart at the seams. It came all the way from Nashville through Lebanon and, you know, come a long distance. The monster storm now leaving residents here, picking up the pieces. My three children when they were young. Cookville's Chester Bush spending the day surveying yes. the damage. And that my house was right here. So you can see about where it came out to the, the block. And uh, that was the corner of the house. County officials saying today they've already finished the initial damage assessment. We have over 400 residents that have been damaged in some way, shape, or form. The National that Weather Service classifying the tornado as an EF4. Officials say at least 18 people are dead in Putnam County, including five children. And amid all this, the sheriff saying sure. they had to deal with well, looting. The arrest was made today on a looter that was uh, attempting to steal copper from one of the houses. But tonight, hundreds of volunteers descending on this neighborhood after a storm shaking this community to its core. We didn't know what we'd need when we got here, so I'm going to go off and get uh, the garden tool and we'll start digging with it. If I'd been here, though, uh, me and my wife would have been... Uh, we would have been deceased, we wouldn't have made it. But how this community will continue down the long road to recovery remains to be seen. Jason Lamb, News Channel 5. Now, let me be clear. There was nothing wrong with that story. In fact, when a disaster rolls through town, a version of that story airs in newscasts all over the country. But let me ask you something. Did you feel anything? Really? Maybe you did, but we have to do better. We have to be different. We have to make our stories more memorable and help our audiences feel something. Let's talk about what kept viewers from feeling something in this story. First, it's writing in false present tense. Basically, that means adding ing to verbs even if they happened in the past. How many times have you heard something like this in a TV newscast? The city council passing an important bill earlier tonight, or the sheriff telling News Center 6 tonight, or in this case, when they were young. Cookville's Chester Bush spending the day surveying yes. the damage. 
I think long ago, news writers got into the habit of writing this way because they thought it would make their story seem more urgent if they didn't write in past tense. But I don't really like writing this way because simply people not talking this way in real life, I mean, people don't talk this way in real life. It's so much more relatable to just write like you talk. Rather than Cookville's Chester Bush spending the day surveying the damage, at the very least, just say Cookville's Chester Bush spent the day surveying the damage. Let's talk about all the cliches in this script. Path of destruction, ripping apart at the seams, picking up the pieces, shaking the community to its core, road to recovery, and the phrase I hate the most remains to be seen. TV news relies too much on cliches. Audiences hear cliches and they say, I've seen this before, I've heard this before. Take the extra time to find a different original way of saying something. Now, how about the graphics in this story? Now, I am certainly not against putting graphics in a story. In fact, when done purposefully, a graphic can help visually reinforce what you're saying and help people remember it. And that's a good thing. But look at all this impactful video we have. What are you gonna remember more? A shot like this or a graphic like this? When a graphic completely takes you out of the environment like this, especially to throw up a hodgepodge of random information, people are less likely to feel something about your story. Speaking of a hodgepodge of random information, this story suffers from the lack of a focus or a theme. And this is a roadblock I see way too often, reporters trying to cram too much information into the story. We have the damage, the victims, the National Weather Service rating the tornado, the county damage assessment, the looting. Now, I'm not saying this information isn't important, but find other places for it, like a stand-up intro or tag. Don't turn your package into a hodgepodge of facts. And because this story was just a bunch of facts, we had no time left over to find a real person and truly develop a character. We saw one or two people in there, but we really didn't get a chance to know any of them because they came and went. Viewers can't get invested in people. They can't feel something for people unless they know something about them. We also couldn't experience anything with that character because there were no authentic, real, natural moments with a character in the story. Every chance you can, your stories should have breaks from your sound bites and tracks to allow viewers to experience real moments, slices of life that naturally happen alongside your character. These moments cannot be staged. Natural moments happen millions of times in real life everywhere, every day, whether a camera is there to capture them or not. It's up to us to position ourselves to capture them, set them up in our writing, then step out of the way and let them play out. You'll see what I mean in a moment, but there were no moments in this story. It was just a string of facts and sound bites. All right, let's get to the story that actually aired. This, of course, was the big story of the day, so photojournalist Catherine Stewart and I turned this story for our 10 o'clock newscast while also turning shorter versions for our 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, and 6 o'clock newscasts. Even when you're pressed for time, you can still deploy techniques that help you turn good stories into great stories. Now, as you watch this story, ask yourself, how do you feel watching this story compared to the first one? We're not finding a lot. There's no simpler way to put it. The damage from Tuesday's tornadoes was big. It came all the way from Nashville through Lebanon and, you know, come a long distance. But the size of what matters to Chester Bush today. Oh my goodness. Ooh. Measures only four inches by six. My three children, when they were young. When the deadly EF4 ripped through Chester's home, it didn't care about his kids. It didn't care about Colonel Bush's 31 year army career. We found that in the rubble. But for all that's seemed against humanity this week. I don't know where all those cards came from. 
Today, we've seen all that was foreign. Chester's a good man, so we're willing to help him out. I wouldn't ask my friends to do it if I didn't help out. Just the way I am. Chester knows even this oh, there's something. is a blessing. Oh, I found my favorite movie. We were, we were soldiers. Yeah. yeah. Because he and his wife had been away in California, his home is gone, but he is not. If I'd been here, though, uh, me and my wife would have been, uh, we would have been deceased. We wouldn't have made it. He wouldn't have been here. Oh, yes. For this. There you go, sir. That's Christmas. Christmas picture with my dad and my uh, and wife and your, brother. You found your parents' pictures. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chester's is a story that repeats itself countless times throughout Middle Tennessee this week. Uh oh, there's my Quaker Oaks lid. <laughs> oh, I thought you had something good there. <laughs> Surrounded by massive ruin. No washcloth. Discoveries don't have to be large. I found a picture of my mom and dad a while ago. For them to be great. I'm going to be okay, just little things, but it's, it's worthwhile. So how did that second story compare? Do you remember more from the second story than you did from the first one? What do you remember? And how did this story make you feel? I'll tell you one viewer was so impacted by Chester's story that they called me after it aired and offered to pay for some of Chester's relocation expenses. So these two stories were obviously the same assignment but the stories came out much differently. They really were two different stories. What did this second one have that the first one didn't? What helped you feel something in the second one? Here are some storytelling techniques I chose to use to make this story more memorable. First, we found a story focus. A story focus begins with a character, emotion, or concept that ties together otherwise disconnected pieces of a story. In this case, we had the aftermath of the tornado, people cleaning up damage, we had people making discoveries of lost items, we had neighbors who had lost their homes. These are all separate elements. What's the one thing I could find out there that could tie all these elements together? It's Chester. Chester is our character. So then, what's our story focus? Is it tornado rips through town? No, not really. That is our assignment. And that's really what the first story you saw was about. Your assignment is to cover the tornado that ripped through a town. But your story focus is not your story assignment. There's a difference. You as a storyteller get to determine what your focus is while you're at the assignment. To help me come up with a focus, I asked myself this, and it's something you should ask yourself too. My assignment today is a tornado that ripped through a town, but what's the story I want to tell, looking around from a much bigger perspective? This story about a tornado is really a deeper story about what? I noticed Chester was picking up a lot of little things, mementos, pictures that had a really big impact on him. And so before I started writing, I said, that's going to be my focus, the search for small items with a big impact. But let's link this back to our character. This isn't just any search for small items with a big impact. This is Chester's search for small items with a big impact. That is our focus for this story. Now keep in mind, there's no right or wrong answer here. This is about what you want to focus on based on what you find while out on your story, and more importantly, what you feel while you're out on your story. And that leads me to my next point. It's important to note here, I only got my focus because I allowed myself to take in the scene. I took off my reporter hat for two minutes and I just looked around, not for a shot to get or someone to interview, but just to take in what I was seeing as a human. That is so important in storytelling. You have a lot of assignments and deadlines to meet. But in order to connect with real people, you need to take in the scene like a real person. What do you see, hear, smell? How do you feel? And use that to help you write. So we have our focus. Chester searches for small items with a big impact. Now 
reflect that focus in your writing. I've decided in my focus I'm contrasting the ideas of small discoveries and big impact, so the opening line to my story reflects that. The damage from Tuesday's tornadoes was big. They came all the way from Nashville through Lebanon and, you know, come a long distance. But the size of what matters to Chester Bush today. Oh my goodness. Ooh. Measures only four inches by six. My three children. Also, notice I didn't say what matters to Chester Bush today was his family photos. I let the viewer make that discovery that we were talking about his family photos by showing a shot of the photo while saying, what matters to Chester Bush today measures only four inches by six. The words don't repeat what's in the video. The words work together with the video. The words hold hands with the video. This way, you're not just listing facts. You're weaving a story with specific shots in mind. By doing this, both your words and your shots become stronger together. In our story, we kept attached to our focus, Chester and the discoveries he was making. We didn't stray away into the extra info about looting or the damage assessment, which we put in our tag. The bonus, when you don't stray away in your package and you stay focused, you have more time left for your story. What did we do with it? We used it to tell our viewers more about Chester, specific relevant details to get a better understanding of who he is. Why? It helped our viewers connect with Chester and feel something for him. Ask questions that get you details that can help people connect with your characters. Details like these. When the deadly EF4 ripped through Chester's home, it didn't care about his kids. It didn't care about Colonel Bush's 31-year Army career. Next, pay attention to the video and audio you gather. This is part of why hanging a wireless mic on someone is so important. You get such good audio that way. Ask yourself, when was the last time you've gone through your video as you're finding sound bites and noted an interesting shot that was powerful or that you could write to, or an interesting comment someone says in their wireless mic when they're far away, not right up at the camera in an interview? It's when characters are mic'd up far away from the camera that they'll usually act most naturally, when those natural moments we talked about have a tendency to happen. In the field, I heard Chester notice that Cards Against Humanity card. I heard what he said about it. I don't know where all those cards came from. So then I asked photojournalist Catherine Stewart to get a shot of the card. Then I thought about a line. And I went to a tool I use a lot, opposing themes. There is a lot of power in opposites. Against humanity, for humanity. So we have our soundbite, plus a shot, plus the line we came up with. And together, it gave us this. But for all that's seemed against humanity this week. I don't know where all those cards came from. Today, we've seen all that was for it. Chester's a good man, so we're willing to help him out. Soundbite plus shot, plus a line. You take away any one of these three things and the whole thing wouldn't have been nearly as powerful. You need a sound bite, plus a shot, plus a line. Be on the lookout for these things when you're out there. Also be on the lookout for even the smallest moments, like this one I noticed when Chester made this little discovery in the rubble. Chester knows even this oh, there's something. is a blessing. Oh, I found my favorite movie. We were, we were soldiers. Yeah. We put that in our story. Why? Because that little interaction tells us something about Chester, and it helps us connect with him. After I knew that little moment was going in there, I went back earlier in the piece, and I made sure to add a little foreshadowing. One of those literary terms from English class, right? Well, a small moment like finding the movie We Were Soldiers will become more powerful if we already know he himself was a soldier. So after I added that little We Were Soldiers moment, then I went back to an earlier point in my script and I wrote this. 
It didn't care about Colonel Bush's 31-year Army career. We found that in the rubble. And all of these little things lead us up to the big moment. This is what I live for in telling stories. As much as writing is important, the best parts of storytelling are when we can just step back and let a natural moment like this take over. If I'd been here though, uh, me and my wife would have been, uh, we would have been deceased, we wouldn't have made it. He wouldn't have been here. Oh yes. For this. There you go, sir. That's Christmas. Christmas picture with my dad and my uh, and wife and brother. You found your parents' pictures. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Notice here, I didn't say he wouldn't have been here for when a volunteer delivered him a picture of his family. We can see that happen in the video already. So I just said he wouldn't have been here for this. To let the natural moment take over, give viewers the context they'll need to understand what they're about to see. Build up to the moment and then just step out of the way. The best writing is not just about what you write, it's also about what you don't write. Uh-oh, there's my Quaker Oaks lid. <laughs> oh, I thought you had something good there. <laughs> okay, so that was another funny little moment I included. You shouldn't overlook these when you're listening to your audio and watching your video because they can make viewers laugh or at least add some levity to a somber story. And now it's time to bring our story to an end. And one powerful way to do that is to go back to the theme or focus that you came up with and talked about at the beginning. It's called full circle storytelling. At the beginning of this story, I said, there's no simpler way to put it. The damage from Tuesday's tornadoes was big. So I'm talking about size there. Remember, my focus was on small discoveries and big impact. Let's bring the closing line back around to size again and have a little play on words. I thought to myself, what are words that are kind of like big? Massive, large, great? Great, in fact, kind of has a double meaning, doesn't it? Great means big, but great can also mean wonderful. So I brainstormed with those words in my head a few minutes. I took the time to come up with a meaningful last line, and I came up with this. <laughs> Surrounded by massive ruin. No washcloth. Discoveries don't have to be large. I found a picture of my mom and dad a while ago. For them to be great. I'm going to be okay. Just little things, but it's, it's worthwhile. One of my mentors, Boyd Hoopert, says the best closing lines make you kind of sit back after you hear them and say, hmm, ain't that the truth? That's what you should be aiming for when coming up with a closing line that people will remember, a line that will help people feel something. Let's revisit that quote from the beginning. People will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. How did you feel after watching that second story compared to the first one? Let's review how we got here. It all starts with finding a story focus. Reflect the story focus in your writing. Allow yourself to take in the scene. What do you see and hear, and most importantly, how do you feel? Write so your words hold hands with your video. Don't say what we can already see on the screen. Say something that enhances what we can see on the screen. Remember your focus? Do not stray away by adding extra details. Ask questions that get you those details. That's what helps connect with people so they feel something. Pay attention to the video and audio you gather. They're filled with little moments you can write to. Don't just use it as wallpaper to play over your voice track. When you can, combine a soundbite, a shot, and a line. It's a trifecta that creates powerful moments that people will remember. But even just little interactions and funny little moments help viewers feel for your characters. If you can find a place to include foreshadowing with a bite or moment, do it. It boosts the power of other moments later on. One of the biggest takeaways today, 
let natural moments take over. Tee up the moment with context and then step out of the way. When it's time to bring your story to a close, return to your focus or theme. And think about the words you use. Really think about them for any kind of double meaning or power that they can provide at the end. Something viewers will feel and remember. You and I have a big responsibility. Our viewers are craving to feel connected to their communities. And as journalists, we can be the ones that help make that happen. Follow these tips and soon you'll be hearing from viewers, I can't believe how that story made me feel. I'll never forget it. Scan this QR code and save my contact information. Reach out to me with any questions you might have or for more examples like this. And thanks for watching.